All right, hello, welcome back to everybody who's joining us for the California Teacher Summit live video cast. Um, I am your host, Robert Pernobost, uh, joining you from CSU Stanislaus. Right now we have over 15,000 teachers um, at 33 campuses and locations across California um, engaging in their own form of learning. Um, today, at this moment, we have Robert Craven joining us. Um, he is an educator with a technology obsession. An educator for 20 years, Robert quickly realized that the impact technology made on both his teaching and student learning, or realized the impact that it had. This discovery started him on his endless journey into the integration, development, and practice of technology and curricular instruct integration. Currently, Robert is the Senior Director of Technology for Tustin Unified School District. He held a similar position in Fullerton School District, was an Ed Tech Coordinator in Saddleback Valley Unified, as well as the Orange County Department of Education. He spent the first 10 years of his career as a teacher and coordinator at Southgate Middle School in LA USD. Robert is an Apple Distinguished Educator and Google Certified Teacher. In 2012, he served on the state superintendent, uh, Tom Torlickson's Education Task Force, and is currently on the Horizon K-12 Advisory Committee. Between 2009 and this July, he served on the Computer Using Educators, Q, Board of Directors, with three years as the board president. So that is a lot of amazing stuff you've done, Robert. So I really appreciate you joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here with you, Robert. So I'm looking forward to speaking with you and uh, everybody out there. Yeah, so when we talked, uh, chatted online a little bit about what you might want to talk about with um, any educators who are on here, mm -hmm. um, a couple of topics came up, um, flexible spaces, one-to-one, -one, and how to get IT support for your project. Uh, what's really speaking to you right now? Well, I think Andrew stole the one-to-one -one bit from me earlier <laughs> today, so I got to go and hear a little bit about him, uh, or about, obviously I know Andrew very well, but about what they're doing up in Union there. Um, and I was able to catch a little bit of Sylvia's as well, as you guys were talking about the making, uh, maker spaces a couple hours ago. So, uh, you know, it got me thinking more about that, really that idea of um, flexible space and learning environments. Uh, and it's one of those things that I think for us, we have a uh, large one-to-one -one going here in Tustin. We're a one-to-one -one school district. We're 24,000 um, students. And so we do have a, a really large program going on. We just finished up year two of it. Um, previously, I'd done one-to-one -one in both Saddleback and Fullerton and in uh, Southgate Middle. So one of the things though, that we're really seeing now as we evaluate the, uh, the last two years here in Tustin are the ideas of um, the ideas around coaching and how that professional development has really assisted our teachers. And then the idea of the flexible space, and they kind of, I think, go a little bit hand in hand. Um, but really, when we, we dive in, that, that idea um, or that big change that we see coming with the flexible space, I find very, very interesting um, because it wasn't one of the things that we were necessarily looking for or that I was expecting to see um, coming out from the district-wide one-to-one. But it's gained such momentum lately, and I think it's just you know a convergence of many things happening in education. Um, and a lot of the research behind it, and also the fact that we are a one-to-one -one district in it. Once the school sites have the technology and the district's providing it for them, it frees up their budget a little bit more to look at what they can do beyond just the uh, computers in the classroom. We also make sure everybody has projectors and really anything that a teacher needs technology-wise they have. And so that's freeing up the schools to really start thinking um, a little bit about how else they can support the students in the classroom. Uh, so we had some really neat projects I think come out especially at the elementary level and the high school level this year um, and after having spent 10 years at middle school I'm a little frustrated that we, we haven't we need to do more in middle school on the uh, flexible space now I think um, yeah. but what was cool at the uh, at the elementary level we're seeing um, the computer labs are no longer quite as needed right when every student mm -hmm. has an iPad um, you don't have the need necessarily for the traditional computer lab, especially when a lot of our schools have, you know, they have still some computers in the room that can be used, three, four, eight, whatever it is, or in the hallway. Um, the computer labs just weren't being used, and what they were being used for wasn't necessarily what 
we would want to see the labs being used for. It was, um, you know, accelerated reader tests, or it was going in and doing, um, you know, doing typing skills, something along those lines that wasn't maybe the most productive use of that that space and something that could be handled more in the classroom. Um, and so we have a, a couple of our elementary started this year, and they tore out the, really tore everything out of the computer lab. They got rid of all their computers, they got rid of a lot of the furniture, and then they did some neat things. And I have to give credit to um, Tom Turner, who was a principal in Saddleback Valley uh, Unified, and he's now with the Orange County Department of Education as their um, uh, director of STEM. Uh, but he brought in his fifth graders to do something similar to this. And so we've replicated it here where the school cleared out everything from their um, computer lab, took the incoming fifth graders to their fourth grade class and said to anybody that was interested, hey, design what you want for your learning space here. Um, wow. They gave the kids some ideas. And it was one of those great uh, moments because you saw the kids having to all of a sudden go in and measure the space, right? They're creating their own blueprint for the space because we didn't say, here's the blueprint for the school. They went in and, you know, some of them took the app where you stand with the iPad and spin around and it does the room layout for you. Others, you know, had their tape measure out and they're measuring everything and putting it out on the grid paper. Um, and so that part was just absolutely fascinating to see how well they jumped in and, and started tackling like that idea of you know, going from these concepts of what they wanted to, oh wait, you know, all right, yeah, we want couches and we want, uh, you know, fun monitors or we want green screen or we want this. Wait, how do we package it all and fit it into the room? How were, were they, sorry, I was going to say, what, were they able to uh, to make some of their their ideas come to fruition? Well, that was the really neat part is after they uh, began to do their measurements, they went online and they started to do research on furniture and they started to look at, and you know, they talked to myself, they talked to some of the other um, technology people, some of our coaches. Um, and so they'd look at the furniture, they'd look at, oh, well, what can you do with a green screen and what do we need for a green screen and how much room do we need? Um, they'd look at, okay, how do we get, you know, more music stuff into the uh, lab maybe so that we can make music or some, some kids were really interested in animation. So they all began looking at uh, what's available for animation. So what was great was you began having these different groups form of students that were interested. And in the end, uh, this one school wound up with I think six different groups of between two and seven kids or six kids in each group. They came out with their own design, their own plan. They researched the cost. The principal said, this year, we have a budget of $10,000 to move forward with. So what are we going to be able to buy with the $10,000? So they had their budget, and they were coming in, and they were pitching one another on what they should buy. <laughs> so it was great. And in the end, they did. They got a, um, a really nice use of the space. They wound up with... Uh, you know, a real easy one was uh, installing whiteboard across uh, one whole wall. And actually, rather than just regular whiteboard, they went with floor to ceiling. Um, this really cool kind of gray smoked uh, uh, board, actually, that sits off the wall a little bit. Looks very modern and cool. Um, and they use fluorescent markers on it to write up and uh, chart out their ideas. So that's one half of the wall. And then the other half, they hung. Um, green uh, felt so they now have a green screen as well that they put in there wow that's yeah. just incredible <laughs> it is it's really neat and uh, you know they brought in some they brought in a, a small 3d printer one of the micro 3d printers if you've seen those they ordered mm -hmm. one of those uh, some of the 3d pens so they had those going um, they had the uh, three or four different types of robots a little I think they're the uh, what are they, the Ozobots are they that you put on the oh, paper yep. Is that what they, what is it? Where, where you draw the, I think they're yeah. Ozenbots, yeah. With, yeah, with the marker. Yeah, that's incredible stuff. Yeah. So they had that. So it was fun because they thought not only what would they want going into fifth grade, but also what's going to work for some of the kindergartners or first graders or second graders and be fun. Um, and so that was really neat. You know, a couple makey makey kits. And Sylvia, it would be perfect for Sylvia. You know, everything <laughs> Sylvia was talking about, they started to slowly implement a little bit. Um, so they did. They got a product done and, um, some of the furniture's on order, so it's coming in this summer, and they'll have that when they come back in the fall. Uh, but what was, I think, really neat is they they got the basics of the room set up, and you know they did a great job of pitching it, and they were so excited about what they were working on. And then, um, you know, they went in at lunch a few days, and they were having fun. And uh, the very last week of school, they just kept wanting to go in there because it 
finished maybe two weeks before school was done. Um, they'd worked on it for maybe the last two months of school. And the fourth grade teacher said, well, that's, that's nice and all, and we're glad you guys use it, but you guys are just going in and having fun. So what, what are we going to do with this space? And so they started thinking, and a couple of them said, okay, we got it. We, we know what we're going to do. And they turned around and uh, wrote, shot, and uh, then premiered their own video on California history, since they're fourth grade, of course, and they do California history. And so they had a whole little 15-minute video on the gold rush and the missions <laughs> that they wrote themselves and acted out on the uh, field. So it really was uh, fabulous to see how um, – you know, the, the one-to-one -one aspect that we have going and gave them the technology to be able to film that and, and use that and they felt comfortable with it. But it also freed up that use of space for them. So it's neat to see how how the school has been able to transform on a really small budget just when we can take off the onus of the devices and the technology in the classroom. So that was uh, one of, I think, my favorite pieces from the past school year to see. Wow, and, and I bet that, and I'm not sure, you know, you did this formally or not, but I bet if you looked at which standards from, you know, especially if they, with the history standards in there, but just in literacy, in their pitches and the math that they have to do in drawing to scale um, mm -hmm. and being able to know how much they can afford taxes and everything else, like I bet that so much was covered in that, that kids like probably didn't even realize that they were working on. And, and that's exactly it, and that's what's so fun as, a, uh, as an educator is to watch these kids and see how much of what they've learned in class, because that whole geometry piece, you know, they're definitely studying that in fourth grade, the room layouts, and seeing how, how they're troubleshooting through that, seeing how they're going online and researching different information. And, and the best part is when they start realizing they have a budget and, well, bean bags cost, you know, $35 from this one source, but we can get it for another, you know, 15 here at, um, you know, at a discounted rate or with free shipping. And, um, that was really, really fun as well to see how they started um, comparison shopping and, and budgeting and, you know, just, as you said, a lot of skills going on there. And then one of the other really th neat things I saw was that um, they, uh, um, they went ahead and this the video itself all happened in the last four days of school. And so when you think about the last four days of school and what are they like on your campus, a lot of times they're, you know, you're cleaning the room, you're finishing up the year and there's not quite as much going on. But in this case, the kids really had some content that summarized what they had done through the, uh, through the spring. So it was, it was neat. And uh, we saw too, you know, along the lines that another school, um, because they had the budget again, started going and, and taking down their chairs and just really inexpensively from Ikea starting to transform their classroom. So I, again, just some neat ways that because the schools are freed up from the budget that we've, uh, we've seen them change furniture in the classroom quite a bit. Um, and, and so it has actually kind of spilled out into some of the other classrooms and to the other teachers? Yes, it has. So we've seen it. Um, at a couple of schools now, and more and more schools are starting to move forward, and that's that's one of the parts that uh, that I really like seeing is that it is going beyond just this school. Uh, we're seeing at um, some of our middle schools and our high schools now, the because we have all the rooms are set with projection, um, you know, Apple TVs, wide eye devices, document cameras, all that. Um, they're now setting up monitors in the back of the classroom because they have the rest of the technology. They're able to go and for you know, $500, you can hang a monitor, run uh, electrical out to it, run the HDMI cable out to it, and now they have a monitor in the back of the classroom for the students that are sitting back there to be able to view if they can't see up to the front or they're not able to see the front. Or for kids now to be able to toss what's on their laptop or their iPad up onto that monitor as they're doing group work, and so now their group, as they're sitting under that monitor, they all have a larger image that they can be looking at and talking and discussing. So set up two or three of those in the classroom uh, you know, real inexpensively, but you're able now to change the dynamic of how those groups work, which at the high school level is really exciting to see where traditionally we've seen so much with rows. Um, we're now seeing that really break down and kids gravitating toward working in groups and using the monitors that are up there as well. That's, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah. just, to, just to hear that it's, it's actually starting to, um, to, to make that change. I mean, because 
that that's essentially it with our makerspace is what I've been trying to do is is to try to help influence what actually is happening in the classroom because I mean you know in that learning space that your kids designed there can be a lot of great stuff happening but that's only for a small part of their day um, mm -hmm. so it's really fantastic to hear that that others are starting to to buy into that as well yeah, it really is, and it's. Um, I'm just excited because we got so much of this we started to see happening toward the end of this school year, so I think the momentum is going to be there when we roll back into the year now to really start seeing this make some widespread change across um, across our district and then hopefully others as well. And we're going to come up and start stealing all your makerspace ideas as well. <laughs> well, you are more than welcome to. We try to share everything we do. Um, I feel like that's a, a theme of what's been discussed today. Um, yeah, it's just sharing and not being afraid to uh, to to expose it. I know that that by sharing it, you know, you're going to see some things that we didn't do so well, and that's great. And I'd love to hear that. Right. That's that's part of the process, right? It's part of that iteration uh, phase of everything, isn't it? Yep. Exactly. <laughs> well, Robert, I do want to say thank you for joining us. I do want to apologize for the feed not being up and running in the beginning, but you. Uh, you went with the flow, and I really appreciate that today. Appreciate it, Robert. Great seeing you, and uh, I see Bill's already lined up and ready to go there. So, hey, Robert. Fantastic. Hey, and Bill. Robert. Good to see you virtually, Bill. So. <laughs> Although you don't fit here, really. We got two Roberts. We're gonna we're gonna name you just Robert Three from now on. Yeah, yeah. You can call me uh, Bobby Bill. <laughs> Bobby Bill. All right. <laughs> don't call me that, please, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Only on podcasts. Yes. All right, guys. Well, thanks right. a lot. Thanks, Robert. Have a great All day. Right. Take care. Bye. All right. Robert, and, how are yes, you? Hello, Bill. So hello. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us right now, I am live from the California Teacher Summit, um, and I am at CSU Stanislaus, but we have joining us right now Bill Selick, who is an edu-awesome uh, educator, um, he is the, I believe, the technology director at Hillbrook School, which is not too far from where I teach and work. Um, so I'm really excited to have you joining us today, Bill. Thank you, Robert. Awesome to be here. Oh, man, I love that little, uh, your little line, all that is edu awesome. Yeah. What, what is edu awesome? Um, what isn't edu awesome? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it, it defies categories, doesn't it? I guess so. That's a great answer. It's a great non-answer. So, well, it, it's, it's a great um, thing to ponder. Yeah. So Fun video fact, in the class. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're trying to actually uh, nationalize the Edu Awesome license plate movement. As some people know, in California, uh, my license plate is Edu Awesome. And uh, Christina Peters, I believe, in Nebraska is starting the trend. She's going to have Edu Awesome in Nebraska. So we have 48 more states to go. How do you decide who's lucky enough to be that teacher who is Edu Awesome enough to have um, that license plate? So I think it's just people that are ridiculous enough to decide, you know what, that would be a super <laughs> cool license plate. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I did. I did see yours and s wish that I had thought of it, but also, I'm not sure what my wife would have thought of uh, having the Edu Awesome license plate. Yeah, my wife is amazing. She tolerates me. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you you uh, suggested that we could talk a little bit about video in the classroom. So what were you thinking yes. about today? Um. So I'm really excited that we have these things that are always in our pockets. Have you heard of these things? They're called smartphones. Oh yeah, I have mine right here. Dude, right? Like, it's amazing. Um, it's crazy that most of our students and I think every teacher now, with the exception of like my mother-in-law now, no, we just bought an iPod Touch. I think everyone that I know now has a smartphone like on them at all time. This is an amazing like video creation device and video curation device. And um, you can do just unbelievable stuff, not only for you as a teacher with your students, but also do these amazing things with your students, right? Mm-hmm. You, and you've heard of the phone. That was my big reveal. I, you've oh, heard of phones. Smart. Yeah, I've heard of the phone. Dang. Uh, I mean, do you have, is there anything else that we can talk about? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we, let's, let's keep going. We'll wing it. 
All right, all right, all right. So you've got videos that you can uh, make do with this the phone, mm -hmm. and got every teacher's got one, or m most teachers, and a lot of our students. So how can we actually use this in a way to impact what we're doing in the classroom day to day? Right. So I, I think that a lot of what people get stuck on is teachers are like, well, I'm busy and I don't have a lot of time to create my own videos. And if I'm going to do it, I want it to be really nice and have like, you know, lights, but I can't afford lights. And, you know, like there's there's all of these like no buts that get in the way. You don't even have to make video to be able to use video in the classroom. Now, there's this other website. Are you ready for it? Are you seated? I'm ready. I'm ready. It's called you you YouTube dot com. I've heard about this from yes. my grandfather. He talked about the YouTube and how the YouTube has all of these videos of cats and exactly. of old songs that he used to listen to. Right. So I know that we're being a little bit ridiculous with it, but um, at this point in my life, whenever I want to learn something, I go on YouTube. A couple of years yep. ago when I was working with my second graders and we started Genius Hour, they're like, all right, I want to know how a car engine works. All right. Well, you're eight. so. Go for it. And uh, inevitably, there are searches on the internet that I just kind of turned them loose and said, go learn, teach yourself. 90% uh, of my students ended up on YouTube, closed captioning online, pausing it, taking notes themselves. It's this unbelievable tool that I think we're just beginning to leverage. I think that students do this automatically. I mean, my students did without any prompting. I wasn't like, hey, go to YouTube. Um, so it's a way that we as teachers can help facilitate student learning. It's a way that we can begin to curate our own videos. And you know whether it's just dozens of playlists or just, hey, this one video is really powerful to get started or as a way to extend lessons or as a way to support students that are struggling with lessons. Or you know here's a tangent if you want to go this way or that way. I mean, just there's so many ways that you can do it. Uh, but without even hitting that record button on this thing called a phone, you're already able to have so many amazing videos that uh, that will show how to do something, not just tell you. You know, we're so used to having people listen and read and um, and not really like look. And um, one of my favorite books as a teacher that really shifted the way I, I thought about things was Brain Rules. Dr. John Medina, do you know this book? No, I don't. Dude, it's it's amazing. He keynoted ISTE maybe four years ago. Um, and, and talks a lot about the senses. And one of the things that really stuck with me is that of the five senses, you know, if you think about it historically, I've, I've heard people say like 20 senses, but whatever. Of the five senses, we'll talk with what I learned in third grade, um, half of our brain's power goes to vision. So if you as a teacher are doing nothing but talking, which is actually kind of what we're doing right now, uh, then half of what the student is processing sensorily, if that's a word, is just staring at you. So mm -hmm. if you're able to have powerful visuals, and I think that very soon we're also gonna blur the line between straightaway video and slideware and photos, it's all gonna just blur into this just visual miss. Um, once we get to that point, you know, we're, our students' brains are just so much more wired, they're able to remember more, they're able to be engaged more, um, and it's just, it's good all around. And, you know, again, that's not even hitting the record button. It's just, it's finding videos, it's curating videos, um, you know, teaching students how to curate videos and what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, I, I as we were talking about that, I was thinking about, yeah, the last few times I've tried to go do something like fix my sink or um, trying to think about what else I was, I was trying to actually solve them that we had with an H, uh, a cable box um, at my father-in-law's. Like I went on YouTube and especially because the instructions online and the written instructions were not that helpful. But with that YouTube video and be able to go back and, and rewind, it's it's incredible what you can do and what um, it kind of the the power of, of learning kind of shifts. Like I can take control, our kids can take control of learning just by using a simple YouTube video. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, like when, once we start getting the idea about creating content, students are no longer limited to handwriting a way to demonstrate knowledge. They're no longer limited to, to bubbling in questions. They're able, you know, at 
at the very least, when, if we're talking about video creation, using something like explain everything and just walking you as the teacher through their learning or making a video for their classmates, making a video for the world and posting it to YouTube without even having a video camera, just very simple, explain everything. Um, some of our teachers over here at Hillbrook School use that with their third graders just for fluency. So the students take a photo of a paragraph they're working on and they track it and you have like a little laser pointer that can follow what you're touching and teachers are able to see and hear over and over and the students are able to see and hear over and over their fluency. You're able to share that with parents, with grandparents, with anyone. Um, it's it's huge. You know, you take that to the far extreme where you're actually, you know, making your own videos and it just it's it's unbelievable. There's there's so much potential and it's it's so exciting and anyone can do it at this point with any device. Yeah, I, I was thinking about it. Well, you just started me thinking about uh, this little subtraction rap video that I made for my kids um, that I made just to try to engage a couple of kids who were not getting the subtraction um, through the, the traditional means. But like there's been over 100,000 views, I think, on this video, which just goes to show that this medium of video and the, the medium of, of inner, you know, adding music into it is a, a is a means of learning that really has not been captured very much. Yeah, absolutely. It's also interesting that it communicates so much more. Um, I'm thinking of that that TED talk um, about the global spread, how global video can push innovation from Chris Anderson, who's like the president of TED or whatever. Um, talked about you know how in the early days of the web, video was just too big. Do you remember those days when it would take like 10 minutes for one image to upload? Like there's no way oh, yes. we're gonna do like high res photos, let alone video. Um, and I just thought that was annoying. I'm like, you know what, then you have to out lighting, edit it, you have to do all this other stuff. And then it occurred to me when I, I watched this, I watched the video several times when I first found it. Um, it communicates more. You see the expressions on the person's face. It's no longer, I mean, just audio podcasts alone are a huge step up from just a blog that's just text, but so much more about, you know, like where the person's leaning, if their eyes get really big, which I do a lot in podcasts, like, dude, do you know this? Uh, communicates so much more to the person. And if you think about it, like in the history of humanity, um, text is actually relatively new. You know, our brains are so hardwired to connect with other human faces and take on so much more of that communication that's nonverbal. That um, I mean, just recording a video of you talking to the webcam for students and for parents communicates so much more and is so much more personable than just a text. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about that too. Like somebody who is just starting out, um, who wants to try something like this in their class, even that first attempt, even if you have to take multiple takes, or even if, as I've done in the past, you end up creating video that has your mistakes in it and you you know you just it was a one cut and you you didn't pause you it's all in there the kids are still going to learn so much more um and it's also <laughs> just the the idea of this of the fact that you're trying something new and and your students see you ad adapting and trying something new um it it, it just gives them to think okay like this makes a little bit more sense I can connect a little bit more knowing that my teacher is trying something I'm trying something um, and that we are all learners no yeah, well, absolutely I mean it makes taking risks the norm in your classroom when you have work and videos that are imperfect your students suddenly have permission to have videos that are imperfect yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite things I did um, a year and a half ago when I was teaching second grade is I tried and I just ended up giving up on it because I, you know, it had to be just right and it had to be posted everywhere and it just, you know, ended up taking too long. Um, but the idea I absolutely love, record a YouTube video every day. I tried to make it one minute long um, and I think I found the most success when I only posted to my, uh, our school Google Apps for Education. So only posting to my school Mr. Selleck YouTube channel one minute hey here's what we talked about today this this and this here's a quick example here's you know like we did this little hand thing and now it makes sense uh, by the way don't forget about your permissions up for tomorrow 
just posting that to your YouTube channel, maybe send that link via Remind and be done. You know, if you make a mistake, whatever, if you get a phone call, whatever, if there's an announcement on the speaker, whatever, but um, just trying to, to leverage video so that parents and students are able to see you when they otherwise wouldn't be able to. So, so powerful. I like that idea. I, I, I know a, um, a principal who tried to start making, um, oh gosh, I can't think of what the, there's a program on your, the iPad and on PCs where you can basically create your own little video podcast with little slides that are in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought that was fantastic. I mean, it, there, there are so many tools out there that, that take um, what we used to have so use so many editing tools to do in order to to make a little um informational like news segment for your school in the morning like have your morning um announcements come in through a, a video that you recorded that morning or the night before right or do it live with a hang on air i mean for crying out loud right now you're making a video and as soon as you hang up this call it's posted to youtube that's crazy Oh my goodness. And while I'm trying to do this, I'm also trying to get us into, um, oh, here we go. Um, getting into our live stream of the video that's going to be happening in a moment or two. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. I, and this has been another learning thing for me. I don't know if you were watching or, or heard any of my, saw my tweets earlier. Essentially, I found out that, um, in order for me to be able to share the keynote, I have to take off my headphones, put the microphone up to the headphones, and put a t-shirt over to muffle all the outside sound. Nice. Well, that's awesome. So it's 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 fun. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a learning experience today. Um, but I actually think, it, and this is something that Sylvia said when she was on. She's like, "Wow, I think you should have a a podcast." It's like. Oh, it's actually not that hard now that I've tried to do it. Yeah. yeah um, I, I, I wish that, you know, I tried to do it a kind of on a lesser scale, you know, try it for something that uh, perhaps, you know, 15,000 teachers weren't participating in. Because um, <laughs> it kind of raised this, it makes it a little bit higher stakes. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's definitely been a really fun learning experience. And I, I've gotten a lot more out of this than I even thought that I could. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thanks for having me on. Yes, thank you so much, Bill. Um, and if I ever do have my own little podcast, I hope that uh, that you'll be on there. I know that I have uh, I've seen some of your podcasts that you've done. You do a few different ones. Um, is there anything that you want to plug? Anything you want to share out there for the teachers who are watching and listening? Well, for those of you on the Twitters, you've heard of that. We didn't talk about Twitter. Uh, those on the Twitters, it's it's a real creative name. It's Bill Selleck. So yeah, I have my own podcast website. It's also BillSelleck.com and, uh, and the YouTubes, YouTube.com slash Bill Selleck. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank right. you. Um, I I feel like Bobby, Billy Bob, Billy Bob Selleck. <laughs> yeah. Bobby Billy, I think is what I said. <laughs> Although yeah. actually Billy Bob would have worked for Robert and Bill. It's so obvious. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I, well, I think it just comes to us as we, uh, as we try these things out. <laughs> right. All right. Well, have a fantastic day. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. So right now we are going to be transitioning. We are going to be um, sharing the last live keynote. Um, there may be a point in time where I have to cut out, and I do apologize about that, but I'm going to try to get you um, everything uh, live as it's happening. Um, yes. Um, if there's anything that's going wrong, feel free to tweet me or to put it in the Q&A because hopefully I will see it from there. Um, otherwise, I hope that this is a very great and inspiring uh, keynote, just like the one that we had earlier today. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, there we go.
there is a little bit of a problem with the screen sharing, um, but we will be back in a moment. Um, I believe that was a kid president sharing a little bit of a good um, encouragement to all of the teachers. Um, and we will be back with that. Um, I've really, I don't know who of you here has have joined us um, throughout the day, um, but I've noticed some real themes that have been coming up um, about connection, about video, um, about kind of not being afraid to try and fail and try again. Um, which all goes along with what I'm trying to do right now and connecting with all of you. Um, and I really, really appreciate um, the, the flexibility, the understanding that uh, I am not going to be able to do was uh, me losing my 24 hour guest access. Um, so right now I'm going to open up that stream, get us in 
to listening to the keynote. Um, let's see. Just a minute. All right, come on, live stream. This is the fun of technology. All right. So here we go. To bring us into our keynote speaker. President said we were going to go to the moon in this decade. And at the same time, Dr. King was combating the civil rights movement with the Freedom Riders. And that same month, the Freedom Riders were getting bombed. So we were having this, this person talking about sending human beings to the moon for the first time. We were having all this discourse in our country. Now, 1961, I hadn't been born yet. I was born in 1964. So this next picture, I call this the pre-me picture because my mom and dad on the left and in the middle, Beams and Grace Melvin, they were thinking about having a family. And so my sister was born in 1962. But they were planning this path for my sister and I as to what would we do to grow up, what would we do? And they were both middle school teachers, um, Lee Corps Middle School. They both went to the same, worked in the same school. So I always knew how much time I had to do things at home before they came home, you know. That little, you know, sneak peek. But um, that was my pre-me picture. And then after that, in 1969, we walked on the moon, the first humans to walk on the moon. And I always look at this language, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I have gone into classrooms and talked to students about this phrase. And I ask the students in the classroom, how many of you want to be astronauts? A lot of the boys raise their hands, the girls don't raise their hand because the language says, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. It's the man space program. The language that we use is so important to make sure that we're inclusive of all people. We need to make sure that the boys and the girls know that they can do these things. And I think about, exactly. But I think about other people who were influential, like Gene Roddenberry, who brought on Star Trek back in the day in the 60s. When you think about all the other ills that were going on in the country at the time, Gene Roddenberry brought on this show where Captain Kirk was kissing an African American woman, the first interracial kiss. But he also had the first intergalactic kiss. He kissed a green woman, too, right? He wasn't discriminating, right? But when I think about what Nichelle Nichols did on the show, she was a trailblazer. She was the first woman of color, the first person of color in a leadership position on television. She wanted to quit and go back to television, go back to Broadway and acting. And Jean said, before you hand me this resignation letter, Please think about her over the weekend. That weekend, Michelle was in Atlanta, and she was walking through a hotel. And the concierge looked at her and said, your number one fan is right around the corner. I said, who's that? She walked around the corner. She saw Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He looked her in the eyes, and he said, Mrs. Nichols, your show is the only show that let my kids stay up and watch at night. because." You guys are doing what I'm trying to do now with the civil rights movement. She tore up her letter. She went back and worked many more seasons for Star Trek. And NASA actually hired her to recruit the first women and minorities to become astronauts. So we need people that look like everyone to help motivate and inspire our kids to dream big, to do the things they want. And you guys in this room, if you're not inspired, you can inspire. So this consortium of, of effort to bring people together to get best practices, 
Nicole talked about get on your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, all these things to keep the conversation going. And Andrew blew my freaking mind with a 15, I mean, 10 to 15 feet. I thought it was like four or five feet. I, I couldn't believe that. But estimation, you know, 180 estimation, fantastic. But getting kids thinking, being curious, getting motivated. And also, if they're motivated, we'll be motivated as educators. Now, here's my dad. Now, the cheapest way to have a vacation in the summertime for an educator was to go camping with your family. And we started with a, a tent, we had a pop-up trailer, and we went, you know, graduated a little bit longer, further. And my dad one day drove home in a Marita bread truck. How many of you remember Marita bread? Maybe that's a Virginia thing, okay? LA, California thing, maybe not. But Marita bread came into my driveway as a child. And I look at this truck and I said, Dad, I know you're doing all these odd jobs to make extra money, but are we going into the bread business too? He said, no, this is our camper. I'm like, no, it's not. It's Marita Bread sign on the side of the truck. It can't be a camper. Come on. You know, and I didn't have a vision. I had no vision of what a camper could be if it had a, a sign on the side of it. That summer was when I really learned what engineering was about. My dad was a language arts teacher, but he taught me over that summer how to build bunk beds that flipped down in this truck, how to, how to plumb a propane tank to a Coleman stove for cooking, how to rewire the electrical system in the, in the entire van. And it wasn't still until we painted the Marita bread sign off the truck that I believed that it was a camper. And even though that whole summer we had you know, gone into building this thing. And for $500, my dad, the language arts teacher, had taught me engineering and science and education through a summer of building. So vision, believing, bringing things to the table, even if you don't know how to teach it, you can learn it, you can resource it, you can collaborate with this, this beautiful body of educators that are all over the state to make a difference and make a change. And the most incredible moment for me, I think, as a, as a scientist, was when my mother brought home an age-inappropriate chemistry set. <laughs> Non-OSHA certified, right? And I made the most incredible explosion in her living room. Burned a hole in her carpet. Had a hand in my development. But there was this activation in my brain seeing that explosion that I ended up wanting to be a chemistry maker. So how do we activate the brain with things that these kids love and that inspires them? You know, Andrew talked about the music. Show them the music. Let them estimate their music. You know, Nicole talked about the bees. Bring the bees out. You know, lots of bees. But we gotta find a way to activate that brain and get them excited. My mom read to me every night the little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And Curious George locked my brain with curiosity. How do we use these tools to unlock these child's imaginations? As Kristen said, also, football was a big part of my life. And as a wide receiver on a running team in high school, many of you know if you're on a running team, you're a wide receiver, you don't get much action, you're blocking all the time. But I remember my senior year, I was running down the sideline. The crowd was screaming, scream crowd. I was screaming, I'm running down the sideline, the ball's coming, my friends are there from college, it's the homecoming game. Everyone's like, Leland, 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 the ball's coming into my hands. I dropped it. Touchdown pass in the end zone, homecoming game, right? The, the crowd is silent. I went to the sideline, my coach, Jimmy Green, grabbed me by the face mask, looked me in the eyes and said, Leland, I believe in you. Get back out there and catch the ball. No, coach, I just failed in a horrific way. I don't want to go back out there. No, you're going back out there. So I'm lined up, running on the sideline, a crowd is screaming. This time, I can see Spalding on the ball as it's coming in. I catch it, we win the game, but unbeknownst to me, there was a college scout from the University of Richmond in the stands who saw me drop the first pass. He heard the crowd screaming the second time. He looked with his head over into the stadium, and he saw me in the end zone. Hey. <laughs> he said to himself, if that guy can recover 
from, from such a horrific failure. All of his friends are there. His family is there. It's a homecoming game. Maybe he can play for us. That one catch resulted in $180,000, $180,000 scholarship to the University of Richmond. If I had given up, if I had not believed in myself, even when I didn't, someone else believed in me. We've got to believe in our kids, even if they're acting up. No matter what they're doing, we've got to give them that base of belief that they can do or be anything they put their minds to. And that's what I had in my community. That's what you'll have in your community as you band together to make a difference, to change. Played some football, NFL, pulled a hamstring, went to grad school, got a master's in material science engineering, went to work for NASA and fiber optics. And then a friend of mine said, Leland, you'd be a great astronaut. I'm like, me? Astronaut? I don't see people that look like me being an astronaut. Hmm. Handed me an application, looked at it, didn't fill it out, set it down. That same year, Charlie Camarda, a friend of mine who was working on this X33 project, he got in. I said to myself, wait a minute. If NASA's letting knuckleheads like that in to be astronauts, <laughs> maybe I can be one too. So the next selection I applied, I got in, and I think about that moment. Oh, by the way, this is our class. Can you guys find Leland in the picture anywhere? In the, in the front row, over to the right, over to the left. 2,500 people applied for 31 positions, and it was mind-boggling, almost as mind-boggling, Andrew, as the 15-foot line dividers in the highway of California. I was not prepared for this event, this training. My parents, my family, my community have prepared me for the tools that I had, but not emotionally to think that I will be blasting off into space one day. And then the unpredictable happened. I was in a training event, and in this white suit on the right, there's a little pad that's supposed to be in the helmet. It's called a Valsalva pad. If you're the kind of person that used to squeeze your nose to clear, you can press your nose against it to clear your ear. My pad was not in the helmet. I went down about 25 feet, told the test director to turn the volume and the headset up. I couldn't hear anything. They took me out, they popped my helmet off, and they realized blood was coming out of my ear. I was completely deaf, completely deaf. Now, as astronauts, you kind of need hearing to, you know, fly in space. So they told me I was medically disqualified to fly. I would never fly in space because they didn't have a smoking gun as to why this happened. And my hearing slowly came back. They operated. They went around and looked inside. They didn't see anything, but I was going to never fly. And that's when I went into education started the Educator Astronaut Program at NASA headquarters, went around the country looking for students to nominate their teachers to become astronauts. And then the other unthinkable happened. February 1st, 2003, we lost Space Shuttle Columbia. Many of you were, you know exactly where you were when that happened. And we take care of our own when these tragedies happen. My job then was to console the families. And the gentleman on the top left corner, Dr. David Brown, I went to his parents' home the night of the accident, and his dad said something to me that was transformative. He said, my son is gone. There is nothing you can do to bring him back, but the biggest tragedy would be if we don't continue to fly in space to carry their legacy, to honor them, to carry on their legacy. I'm not flying. I'm having to honor their legacy in a different way. And then as we go to the different memorial services around the country, the chief of all the flight surgeons sitting beside me on every flight and he says to me at the end of my tenure at headquarters he brings me in his office and says i've been watching you i've been taking notes i'm going to sign the waiver for you to fly in space so if i had given up if i had said what some of my colleagues said you should quit you should write a book to nasa get paid that's what they said i said hmm maybe but if I had not stayed the, stayed the course, stayed the path, it never would have happened. None of this would have happened. I wouldn't be here talking to you today. And I think things do happen for a reason. I was very blessed to find two shuttle missions. The first one was in 2008. I installed the Columbus Laboratory, the European Space Agency Laboratory, to the B-1 
vehicle. And the funniest thing is, when I got this assignment, I'd never flown before. The Europeans have been waiting 10 years to get this thing installed. So as I was congratulated by some of the German flight controllers, one of them turned to me and said, Mr. Delibin, we've been waiting 10 years. Don't screw it up. <laughs> So as I'm installing this thing, you know, I'm thinking about my geometry, my trig, and all these things, and pulling on the hand controllers, and it's slowly, slowly coming closer and closer. And in my back of my mind, it's like, don't screw it up. <laughs> Docked successfully. It was wonderful. This is what it looks like after the docking. And that night, Dr. Peggy Whitson invited us over to dinner in the Russian segment. This is the first time that NASA's ever had a female commander of the International Space Station. She is large and in charge of all of these unruly men. Some of them are French, German, Russian, people we used to fight against, but now working, collaborating together as one team, sharing a meal, listening to Sade while we're, I mean, Smooth Operator was playing while we're sitting there eating this meal. And we're going around the planet every 90 minutes. It's 17,500 miles per hour breaking bread with people we used to fight against with the first female commander of the space station. Andrew, that blew my mind, right? And then we look down and we, we fly over Afghanistan and Iraq and these places of unrest, and it's simply stunningly beautiful. There are no wars. It's just one community working together for the betterment of not mankind, humankind. That's what you're here to do today. You're here to band together of advanced, the next generation of explorers, and to be inspired and stay inspired. My second mission was in November of uh, 2009. I've got a little video here, but I think I'm gonna skip and to do this. That, you are clear to launch a we go to the next one, because I wanna make sure that we talk about some other things. This is a view looking over the Andes Mountains that I took with that camera. You see that very, very thin blue line, which is our atmosphere, which keeps us alive. So when you think about STEM education, you think about the science of technology, engineering, and mathematics to understand how we preserve our civilization here. It's what we do. And then this video here is the video that makes all the boys and girls going to come after us. I'll let you see. Work out in a minute. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to find this Wow. All right. Fight. Yeah. Oh, oh man, you guys are. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Here, this is space food. An M&M sandwich. Space. Let me yeah. do that before you start doing that. <laughs> Too late. Ooh, that looks yummy. Yeah, that's my sandwich, man. We need to do a cross sandwich. sandwich. <laughs> Look at that. Three questions that I went to a conference on reimagining education. 
how to prepare students for jobs you can't yet imagine, how to ensure all students can meet the level of rigor, and then how to build learning experiences to spark passion. Flip that back to yourself, sparking the passion. If the kids see that you're passionate and inspired about it, they're going to follow right along with you. have that same attitude about the lives of these kids that we're inspiring. Right? One wrong move may send them down a path that they don't come back from. One right move will inspire them to be the next generation of explorers. Thank you very much and Godspeed. All right, I am coming back. Join us back in here. Um, thank you to Leland Melvin for that great. Let's see. All right, stop screen sharing. All right. Welcome back. Um, for those of you who are just joining us or who have, may have joined in in the middle of that keynote, um, we are live at the California Teacher Summit. Um, I am live from CSU Stanislaw. Um, and joining us, we have Miss Amy Fideji. Uh, let me just get a little tweet out, tone her. Oh, hey, hey. Oh yeah. So what? What is the? What is wrong with my lower third, Robert? It's so sad. I don't know because my lower third is going. I I know. Well, Amy Fideji is um, principal at Penn Grove Elementary School. It's her fourth year um, after teaching for seven years after, before that, um, which is part of the Petaluma City Schools. Um, she's passionate about sharing her school story supporting the learning and teaching going on campus, as well as connecting with other educators around the country and beyond to become better together. Um, so Amy, thank you so much for joining us. I believe, um, unless I'm wrong, we've had teachers, we've had district administrators, we've had um, outside organizations, but I don't know that we've had a principal on yet today. So I'm oh, very well, excited for you to be joining who, us. Who better to follow an astronaut than an elementary school principal, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, great, great lineup there, Robert. Thanks. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, you know, the, today is all about our teachers, our educators. So we're, we, I, you know, <laughs> I, I am very happy to have you on. Board Good. Today. I'm I'm so glad to be here with you guys. So glad to be here. And it's such, um, I'm feeling a little sad because Pengrove's a year-round school. So we're already back in session and I feel like, oh, I oh, want wow. my, yeah, I want my teachers to already be like, or to be out at Sonoma State down the street, hanging out with, uh, with everybody and seeing what's going on. But that's all right. This is the good thing about being virtual is that we can, we can tune in later to all the good goodness that happened today. Yeah, and, and I, I hope, think that there'll be some uh, of the actual keynotes that will have some real official streams put up or real right. official feeds, um, right. given that I have had some learning curves with mine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been fun. It's been fun. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. What's been the highlight of the day so far? Um, I feel like the highlight of the day from everything that I have heard um, has been Ed camp and just a lot of people yeah. who had never experienced Ed camp before realizing that they could 
lead a discussion and be part of a discussion, um, even though they hadn't even considered doing that when right. they arrived. Totally. That's awesome. Yay. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, being as my school is already in session, I wanted to um, just like, I was thinking, oh, what fun topic do I have? And um, so I thought just everyone's kind of gearing up, it feels like, to start back to a new year. And we are actually about to start, uh, week, next week will be week three for us. So wow. um, yeah, so I thought I, would, I could just kind of share with you some of the things that have been really fun and exciting about the start to our year at Pengrove and just around Petaluma, and then we can go from there. That sounds fantastic. Okay. Cool. So um, also one of my little, like one of my little side projects in life is just to help support as many principals and administrators as I can along the way with, um, just getting outside the box and can you hear me okay because it's loud in your background but i want to yeah, make sure that I, I'll, I'll mute it so then um so i'm not screaming yeah awesome <laughs> i am good at screaming though so watch out um so anyway just a side passion of mine is just connecting with other administrators and just trying to give them the courage and um, the flexibility to do something different and um, to just think about everything that we do in a new way. And one of the most fun things for me this last year was um, just rethinking the start of our school year. And um, so I just really wanted to, you know how it is when you're a teacher and you're heading back to school. And um, so I just wanted it to be a day that people could really look forward to. And um, just knowing that we were going to be doing some learning together, we were going to talk about our vision and goal setting for the year, but we were just going to have fun together and, and party a little bit too. So, um, the way that we structured our day, we have two teacher work days before our students come back and I get to spend about a half of one of those days with um, my staff. And so we just spent some time, uh, we had some staffing changes, so doing introductions and all of that. And one thing that I did this year for the first time was I invited our custodial staff in. Um, Fred and Keith came in and I asked for just an update from them, which was really sweet. I love like the moments that kind of catch, catch me off guard. Like I knew that I wanted Fred and Keith to share all their hard work they'd been doing over the summer. But um, just like getting to watch the staff like listen to them talking about waxing the floor of the multi-purpose room and things like that. You know, they, they take such pride in what they do and to have like, not very often do we have our custodians get to share with the staff, the things that they've been working on. So that was really, really fun. And our teachers were all cheering for them and just lots of smiles in that space. Um, so we kind of got an update from everyone, um, shared some summer highlights, and then we always do um, some hopes and dreams together as a staff. And so we spent some time just people are shouting out their hopes and dreams for the upcoming school year. Um, so we have a couple of our teachers who are expert hashtaggers. And so uh, what I mean by that is, you know, we might be, for example, we're going to be doing something this year called Schools in Motion. And so our whole school, we're a K-6 elementary with about 400 students. Um, here in October, we're going to start our day every day together doing some physical activity together with some really fun music and some routines and kind of just setting our minds um, getting ready for learning. And so one of the teachers, her hopes and dreams were that we would all be um, moving and exercising a lot together. So one of our teachers is writing that up on the whiteboard and the other one, hashtag expert, is writing hashtag shake your booty. So we get to go, you know, we're having some fun throughout that. You're going to have to unmute yourself because it's just weird yeah. to laugh and not hear you. So that's not working out. Um, so we do hopes and dreams together, which is really fun because, um, because it's just open to anything you get to hear like some teachers are sharing like a personal hope and dream for themselves, like more work-life balance, you know, and other people are sharing real specific curricular goals. Like I want to, you know, be a better science teacher. I want to dive into this a little more. So you just get this huge spread and it kind of just, you get to see that whole spectrum, which is really fun. So we did that. We watched some um, inspirational videos. We laughed and cried together um, with some good old YouTube. Can't get it. Can't get enough of that. And um, you know, we talked about just how important it is, especially this year. We have a lot going on on campus. We have um, new furniture in all of our classrooms, so really trying to create active learning environments for our students. And then we're also going one to one iPads. <sighs> which we're going to not talk about right now. <laughs> and um, 
So just knowing that that's all coming, like I think as, as a principal, I feel like if I don't stop and acknowledge that in the room, that there are, there's a lot of change and whether, I mean, if you're crazy like me and you're a person who embraces change and loves change, um, that it still like creates different feelings at different times. And, um, you know, so I think just stopping and like recognizing that was, was really important as a staff. So, um, we, the way that I kind of wanted to give everyone experience with their teacher iPads, um, because our students are getting them, but honestly, we have barely done PD around iPads and their capability and what you can do with them. And, um, our district has an iOS summit that we're hosting coming up here in August, but since we start early, um, it makes it a little challenging. So we just, um, I gave my staff an assignment to go on a photo walk and I pr provided a little PD for them, um, just about taking good pictures and things you could look for and all thanks to um, educators that I've collaborated with, um, especially Nicole Delacio. I totally stole a bunch of her stuff. And, um, and then we just sent our, I sent our staff out on, um, on a photo walk. And the cool thing was that they were just like with each other, trying new things. They're all around campus. You can hear them appreciating things that they hadn't noticed or hadn't recognized in a while. Um, not knowing how to turn the camera on, playing with, you know, like, I mean, we ha it was so fun. Um, and then, you know, and then there's also, we have a group of teachers who um, they're using Instagram all the time and they're using all these tools. And so they're teaching other teachers like, oh, and you can make a photo collage and you can do this. And so the learning and the teaching was crazy. And I had, and I did nothing, which was great. And it was this perfect, like, this is what we want for our students, you know? And so um, that was really fun. We also, our whole staff is on Twitter at Pengrove, um, but we're not all active on Twitter. And so one of their assignments was when you make your collage, um, then you need to tweet it. So then it was like, how do I download Twitter on my new <laughs> iPad? It was awesome. It was everything that like, you know how when you're a teacher and you take your class to the computer lab and they're all just shouting out questions and hands are up and you just can't stand it. That was like all happening in this room, which was so, it was just, it was so great. Um, and a, a really good time to just stop and be like, look at all these productive struggles, you know, that you guys are going <laughs> through. And like, I had an example where um, I totally did not want to write a welcome back letter to our community because I just, when we were coming back for the school year, because I just feel like it's static and it's old school and I wanted to welcome everyone back and I wanted to give everyone the information and let them know I was thinking of them, but I just decided to make a quick little iMovie instead. And it was my first iMovie. And oh, isn't that embarrassing? I've never made an iMovie before by myself. Um, so I shared with them my experience of struggling through that. And so I think that just that whole, like me being vulnerable with them and then taking them through this experience where they had it wasn't just like, how do I use this app or how do I use this? They really had, there was so much learning and teaching going on with each other. It was really cool. So um, for principals who are trying to think about, oh, first staff meeting, like the worst thing you could do is fill hours of people's time with something that they could have read in a memo or on a doc or like sit there and talk about Oh, yeah, our duty schedule. It's my absolute worst. <laughs> I can't get away from it, though. It happens every time. Um, but, it, but it's so good that you are really embodying. I mean, you know, we talk about like what, how we want the classrooms to flow, and you are, you are actually treating your PD um, and staff meetings in a way that you are modeling what you want to see in the classroom, which is fantastic. Well, I try. I miss teaching so much. And Lisa High feels like your staff is, they're like your students. And I do feel, I do feel like that, you know, and a lot of like, I want to give to them so much. And, um, and it's fun to see it trickle down into the classroom. So my hope was, you know, to provide some fun for that day. Um, and we had a couple guest speakers come in and um, just chat and mix it up. Like, I think anytime you can bring guest speakers in or just you know, people to share experiences. It's so much better than listening to just like, bleh. Um, so yeah, so then what I did do was provide just a huge doc. It was like 12 pages long of just nuts and bolts stuff that people needed to know. And it was like, read through this on your own with your team later. 
make comments, sign up for this, sign up for that. And that is just like, there is no reason that people should be doing that kind of stuff in staff meetings anymore. At least from, I mean, we have such a small amount of time together as a staff and as a learning community that it's just, I don't, it's awful. I, so yeah, so I try not to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. We're, we're, then, we're moving in that direction as well. Yeah. And it takes time. Like I still mess up along the way and I still, I walked out of my, this day was great. Our first day back. And then I walked out of my like next meeting with the staff and I'm like, Oh, I, I should have, I could have done this better. Like I, you know, I don't get it right all of the time. And I, but it's that constant reflection of how could, how could it be better? You know, what can we do next time? And, um, and it's fun just trying new things. I think it sometimes surprises me the things that work so well or that really resonate with people. So I just thought, let me, I just want people to reflect and just have like a moment on one thing that they really want for themselves this year. So I just threw out some cardstock on the table and before we left, right before lunchtime, everyone was starving and, and uh, we were all frustrated with our iPads and, um, and so I'm like, okay, you guys on this, on this little cardstock, I just want you to have a couple moments with yourself and think about like, what's one thing that you really want this year. And I gave them a couple sentence starters. Like I wonder, or this year my hope is, and they took it so seriously. I left the room to go set up for our lunchtime party because that's the time when I unveil our school theme. And so I had to like get my cowboy boots on and everything because our, uh, our, our theme this year is saddle up, which is amazing by the way. Um, so those are some serious eye nods that you just gave someone, <laughs> but anyway, so I left the room and like 10 minutes later, they barely started trickling out one by one and my staff took this activity really seriously and they all wrote these amazing like hopes and dreams, wishes, wonderings for themselves for this year and we now have them hanging up in our staff room. Um, just like as a great reminder, like all year long when those days are hard and you had a student that, you know, was really pushing you over the edge or a hard story or a difficult, you know, scenario, just the fact that we have those memories together that are going to be up. Um, that was a really sweet activity that surprised me. So that's nice. That's actually, uh, they're, they're doing a similar thing right now inside of oh, the, really? uh, during the teacher summit. Yeah. So everybody has, is getting a postcard and they're asked to, you know, share some things they learned, something they want to bring back, um, something they don't want to forget about doing, you know, as they start the year. Um, and so they're they're filling out these postcards, and they'll be mailed to them. Um, I think in a couple oh, of weeks that's or so a few cool. weeks. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. That's very yeah. fun. Yeah, and I love that. I, I love that you you did that, and I didn't even you know it's not even a plant that we were discussing that. I know, right? I mean, I am a little disappointed. Like, I do feel like you should have a cow a cowboy hat on with me for. Oh, well, what? one one second. Hey, can I borrow that hat first? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. So, so I don't, I don't have a cowboy hat, but I do have um, my own. Oh, yes. Oh, oh. I've got the warrior. Amazing. The warrior hat. I like yeah, it. I've I got like the warrior. It. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's the, good. Uh, the CSU Stanislaw mascot is the warrior. Nice. So they, they had the warrior out for some uh, photo ops today. That's so fun. Speaking of photo ops, this is also not a planned story, but um, something we did on the first day of school this year was um, I've kind of had a dream to have a family photo wall somewhere on campus because I'll see like, you know, a student and I'm like, wait, I think that's so-and-so sibling or is that their stepdad or I can't, you know, like all you see people not all together. So we set up a family photo booth the first day of school and I sent tweets and remind messages to make sure that parents stopped by with their kiddos. So um, we just had a little space out there for families to come and get a family photo together. And then, of course, like not everyone's there on the first day. So we do a back to school barbecue that's coming up in a couple weeks, too. And we'll have our photo booth out there again. So hoping to just create like a space on campus where I know I'm not the only one who's like that mom goes with that, you know, child. And so just a little place where, um, where we can build some more community through that as well. And we wow. got some good feedback on that. So that was fun. I really, really just want to be a teacher at your school. <laughs> it's actually, you know, what's so fun is that starting on the year round schedule, 
so many um, people swing by in the first like, you know, July and August crazy teachers and administrators are like starting to miss school. And so I've just, I feel so lucky. I've had so many um, good friends, Jennifer Clasco and Joe Wood came by yesterday. And, and when I say came by, they drove like two hours from Sacramento to just to come hang out, you know, and it's just, it's awesome. Well, I, I, full disclosure, I did drive through Petaluma a few, a couple of weeks ago, Robert. Um, but, but I saw that you were not in town on that Friday. Oh my gosh. But, I know. I, I felt terrible, but uh, you know, it was part of we we were um we were driving through for our little um anniversary. We went oh, to sweet. Tamales Bay. Yeah. Then we uh we went to that bakery up there that's uh I think Bovine it's Bakery. Flower. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't know that one. Oh, uh, I think this one's called Wildflower and it's about twenty five minutes north of Tamales Bay. It, oh nice. I mean it was kind of out of the way, but it was delicious. Uh, oh fun. Um yeah. next time you guys are over here, Cashley's family owns Bovine Bakery, which is in Point Reyes. Oh very nice. Uh, but yeah, well I hope hopefully Katina won't find out that you were in Petaluma or you'll oh. still be in trouble. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Well we were we were on the way home. We did I, I mean we did stop in Petaluma to get a lavender latte at uh oh in downtown nice um, but we you know we had other commitments that we had to get to for the afternoon yeah lovers yeah. weekend happy anniversary <laughs> thank you but yeah <laughs> we will we will make a plan to come up sometime and yeah. see you and to see tina and because it just sounds like incredible stuff happening up there and i just like yeah yeah we're doing a lot of fun stuff in uh petaluma right now the the active learning spaces for our students has just it's that's another very unexpected i knew it was going to be different and great and exciting but um we our teachers took this challenge like really seriously so we had filled two dumpsters full of trash between the time that school got out and school started which is just a six-week period <laughs> for us and we like all of the furniture came out of every single classroom um, with the exception of like, you know, a few, like a couple filing cabinets here, there, or the other. I have so many teachers that got rid of their teacher desk. They were raising whiteboards to get bookshelves under there. They were taking cabinets out. Like, I mean, our classrooms look so much bigger than they did before just because we try to declutter and get rid of, you know, I think that we we all know that educators are hoarders and if you don't know that then that's mm -hmm. a problem but um i think that we just wanted to create more inspiring spaces for our students and so we have all these cool little corners and nooks and crannies on campus and um it it is really neat there's a variety of seating and tables and not really desks but it feels like i'm i maybe i just picked all the right people to talk to today um but it like so many of the people that that came on were talking about the same things about how oh, really the flexible learning space is a really new thing so robert craven talked about mm -hmm. it um i think andrew schwab robert um, copies me all the time though <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean it just I, it seems like flexible learning spaces and not being tied to the classroom in the same way is, is definitely a big yeah, change. Totally. Yeah. We have um, some rolling whiteboards or in all of our classrooms, we have rolling whiteboards now. And just like, it's crazy when you see, like there are these two little first graders just over there practicing their tally marks and writing their numbers. And just like the fact that the students are empowered to do that in like the ninth day of school. And I mean, it's, it's just been so fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, there is probably going to be a lot of noise. Probably is yeah, a lot of noise from my end right now. And it looks right. like the session is ending. Um, that call awesome. to action that I told you about, where they're filling out the postcards, and I think it cool. is moving into a little bit of uh, kind mingle of mingle time. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's nice. Time. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I hope you get to mingle with some awesome educators. Thank you very much. I I really have appreciated having you on, and it's always great to talk to you. Likewise, Robert. Thanks for the invite. All right. Have a great All day. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. So for those of you who have been joining us, I really, really have appreciated you staying with us all day or for whichever parts of the day that you were able to be a part. Um, this was live from the California Teacher Summit.
Um, I have been Robert Pronovost at CSU Stanislaus. I am the Director of Curriculum and Instruction in Ravenswood City School District in East Palo Alto, California. It has been my pleasure um, sharing some of the experiences today with you, sharing some great guest speakers. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of the guest speakers that we've had um, because we have had so many amazing people. There were other people who really wanted to be a part too and they did not get to be a part. Um, you know, even, uh, even Peter Reynolds, um, who's one of my favorite children's authors, he really wanted to be here. He says hello to everybody. Um, but from Justin to Rushton to Trevor and Lisa, Andrew, Perneal, Sylvia, Robert, Bill and Amy, um, Diane, um, just thank you everybody. Um, it's been a fantastic day and I wish you all the best as you head back to school.